All right, so All right. I'm more than happy to introduce Lucas, and I'm going to mispronounce it, I'm very sorry, Champollion, okay, um, who is a professor at NYU, and he will talk about intertheoretical relations in linguistics as well, more specifically about uh, compositional semantics and event semantics, which is a case study here in intertheoretical relations. So um, we are very happy to have you here. And thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to speak here so closely to the United Nations in the German House. Um, my talk is about the uh, relation between various theories within compositional semantics uh, and within event semantics. And I've tried to um, arrange this talk in such a way that it's uh, accessible for a wide audience and still interesting for those who uh, know uh, a thing or two about semantics. Um, I also want to point out for those who are watching this talk online that um, the talk is based on a handout which you can access uh, online from uh, the uh, URL uh, is.gd slash g-o-w-o-f-i. Uh, I'll also be using um, a software application called the Lambda Calculator, um, which is available in two editions, a student edition and a teacher edition. The student edition, which I will not be using in this talk, is available at lambdacalculator.com. The teacher edition is available to anyone which teaching, with teaching credentials from me. It looks like this, and I'll be using this uh, to show some examples of derivations within Montague semantics um, as we go along. Uh, and finally, um, I want to mention that this talk is in a certain sense a condensed version of a wider research program of which you can find, um, uh, you can find uh, more information in lecture notes that are posted online. Um, if you want to use a Lambda calculator uh, in order to follow the derivations along um, at your own pace after the talk, then you are welcome to do so. In order to do that, you will need to download a companion file which you can get from is.gd slash y-i-s-u-b-i. You download this and you don't download the application, student version or teacher version, whichever you prefer, uh, and then you open the file in the application. So that's for the benefit of uh, those who are watching this on iTunes University or elsewhere. And with that, let me now uh, turn to the handout. I assume everyone in the room has one of these handouts, but that's not the case, please raise your hand. Everyone has a, Every, everyone has a handout. Wonderful. So um, I do have the handout here. Um, so it looks like this, but I'll be talking from just a paper version from now on. Okay, so uh, within compositional semantics, there are different theories of uh, the meanings of words. Uh, typically, these are not words like uh, horse and cabbage, but these are logically more interesting words, shall I say. Things like and, things like um, every, and other quantifiers, uh, and things like uh, the natural language word not. So you recognize these words as those that have um, corresponding uh, equivalence or near equivalence in predicate logic. Uh, and so one of the su success stories of Montague semantics, which I will be using interchangeably with the term compositional semantics, is that there is a close match between natural language and predicate logic, as well as the relatives of predicate logic, such as modal logic, for example, with respect not only to the way in which the truth conditions of entire sentences, entire formulas can be derived but also with respect to the way in which the contributions of individual expressions, like individual words in language, individual logical uh, connectives in predicate logic, um, the contributions of these expressions to the entire sentence or to the entire formula in which they occur can be modeled. Now, within compositional semantics, within Montague semantics, um, there are debates for example, debates about whether the meaning of and should be represented in a similar fashion in natural language to the way it's represented in predicate logic, which amounts to intersecting two sets, or whether it should be represented, for example, as 
putting together two individuals to form a collective individuals. This is just one of several examples of debates that are currently open within compositional semantics. What I want to do in this talk is I want to showcase three of these debates. One having to do with quantifiers, one having to do with conjunction, and one having to do with negation. And since this is a conference on intertheoretic relations, I will talk about the ways in which these debates, these three debates, relate to a different set of assumptions, which I will talk about under the heading of event semantics. Event semantics comes from the work of Donald Davidson, Terence Parsons, and others within philosophy and linguistics, and it concerns itself with the idea that the meanings of verbs involves reference to events. For example, um, if we consider a transitive verb like stab, then whereas Montague semantics proper, that is Montague semantics in the style of Richard Montague himself and in the style of those after him that do not use events, whereas Montague semantics proper represents the meaning of stab as a set of pairs of a stabber and a stabby, event semantics would add events into the mix and that might have different forms. It might mean that the verb stab denotes the property of being a stabbing event, or it might mean that the verb stabs denotes the relation that holds between a stabber and stabby and a stabbing event, or, uh, uh, or intermediate forms um, between these. So what I want to do in this talk then is talk about how assuming event semantics influences the choices that one is led to make when it comes to modeling the semantics of coordination, of negation, and of quantification. And the thesis of this talk will be that the choices that you make with respect to whether or not to represent the, the meanings of verbs using events, these choices do not influence the choices that you can make with respect to these other three domains. In other words, I want to show independence between these theories. Now, this is important because Previously, it has been claimed for each of these three domains, quantifiers, negation, and coordination, that adopting event semantics constrains your choices, whether because it makes certain implementations or certain viewpoints within each of these theories outright impossible, or whether because it favors some implementations over others. So I'll argue against this point of view, and I'll show that if we implement semant event semantics in the right way, uh, then we are free to choose between theories of coordination, quantification, and negation in ways that are directly opposed to what has been claimed before. Now, I want to start by um, portraying three um, cases of, uh, uh, these three cases uh, of debates within compositional semantics, um, starting with uh, the semantics of quantifiers. So very briefly, quantifiers like every girl have been given two kinds of treatments within Montague semantics. Montague himself assumed that uh, a verb phrase with a quantifier like, let's say, kiss every girl, um, is not assigned an independent meaning. Rather, it is assigned a meaning in the presence of a variable assignment. And that variable assignment is a function from natural numbers to, in this case, girls. <coughs> So the idea is that when you have a verb phrase like kiss every girl, on Montague's view, you represent that verb phrase at a syntactic level as something like kiss and then a trace. The trace is that which has been left by an application of a rule Montague calls quantifying in, which takes every girl, moves it out of the way for a while, and re replaces it by something which introduces an index, a natural number. And depending on whether the variable assignment maps this number to this girl or to that girl, the resulting meaning of the verb phrase is going to vary. It's going to, be, um, it's, it's going to be a property of individuals who kiss the girl in question, where the girl in question is whichever girl is um, determined by the variable assignment. So this is a quantifying in view. This is a syntactic view of quantifiers because it, re it requires a syntactic level of representation that's different from what we actually hear, that's different from the surface structure, in that the quantifier is not interpreted at the place where it appears, but it's only interpreted at a later stage. Now, in contrast with this, there is, a, uh, there is also a semantic view which has been put forward by 
uh, for example, Hendrix and Barker, on which the meaning of kiss is type shifted, which means it is changed from a set of pairs to a relation that holds between a person who kisses and the meaning of a generalized quantifier. So that kiss every girl will then be given a semantic meaning that's independent of any assignment function. It will, it will denote the set of all those entities that kissed every girl. So we now have a syntactic view and a semantic view of quantifiers. And the question is, first of all, which one is a correct one? And I won't answer this. But the second question is, if we also adopt event semantics, then are we forced to choose between one and the other? And here I will argue that we don't. I will do so in a little while. And before I get into the technical details, I want to introduce the two other, um, the, the two other uh, case studies, namely coordination and negation. Uh, and then I'll say what I'll do. And I'll, I'll go into the details a little bit. So what I'll do in the case of conjunction is I'll consider two theories. On one theory, the basic meaning of a conjunction like and amounts to intersection of sets. So that if I say John walks and talks, I take the set of walkers and I take the set of talkers and I place John in the intersection of these sets. On the other theory of and, which we might call the collective formation theory, if we have a sentence like John and Mary met, there is nothing to intersect here. Rather, we assume that the word John denotes the individual John, the word Mary similarly, and that the function of the word and is to take these two individuals and form a collective individuals. You may think of this as a set contain, consisting of John and of Mary, or perhaps the muriological sum, whatever you like to think of in terms of collective individuals. And then the word met, which is a collective predicate, is applied directly to this collective individual. So these two theories are in stark contrast to each other, and they are debated. Now, if you look at these two sentences, each of the two sentences favors one of the two theories and is a challenge for the other. And I won't resolve the tension between the theories, except to point out that event semantics is compatible with both of them, unlike what has been claimed in the past. And finally, the last uh, opposition that I want to highlight is between two theories of negation. And here I want to focus on truth functional negation, that is on the kind of negation which is intuitively uh, best thought of as a natural language correlate to predicate logic negation. Something which takes the truth value and flips it around, or if it applies to a verb phrase, as in it did not rain today, something which takes, um, sorry, as in um, John uh, did not, um, Brutus did not stab Caesar, as something which takes a set, namely the set of those that stabbed Caesar, and turns it into its complement, namely the set of those that didn't stab Caesar. Now, one of the theories of negation says that negation in natural language simply means the same as negation in predicate logic. That is, it amounts to forming the complement of a set, or equivalently to applying logical negation, give or take um, some type shifting in order to apply it to the right kind of constituent. The other theory of negation is more involved. And it has to do with the idea that in event semantics, many people think of the meanings of verbs and of verb phrases, and more generally, of the constituents to which negation applies in terms of sets of events. I'll say right away that I'll argue against that view. But the standard and the received view is that on event semantics, um, a verb phrase like stab Caesar denotes the set of all those events in which Caesar was stabbed. In this case, presumably a singleton set. The question then is, if that's the meaning of stab Caesar, then what should be the meaning of don't stab Caesar or not stab Caesar? So when you have, um, when, when you have event semantics, it has been claimed that it is, not, it is not possible to give a meaning to negation in terms of complement or in terms of logical negation. Without going into the details, I will show that this is not so, and that it is possible to give the classical meaning of negation even in the presence of event semantics. But in order to do this, and in fact in order to do what I've said is possible with respect to coordination and with respect to quantification, we first need to look a little bit more closely into event semantics, and then we'll have to introduce 
a little twist to the way that event semantics is usually implemented. Um, for this, let's look at quantification in a little bit more detail. If you assume that verbs involve reference to events, then these events need to be quantified over, and it is usually assumed that this happens by an existential quantifier. So that if you say something like spot barks, then this is represented as a formula or as equivalent to a formula in predicate logic in which there is an event which is existentially quantified over, and this event is a barking by spot. Now, as soon as we add quantifiers or negation into the mix, we have to think about the scope of this event quantifier with respect to the things that we have added. So that, for example, spot didn't bark, in principle, could have two meanings depending on whether negation takes scope above or below the event quantifier. However, we find empirically that of these two meanings, only one is ever attested. And we'll find the same also in the cases of quantification um, more generally. So in general, the event quantifier always takes the lowest possible scope. What this means is that if I say spot didn't bark, this does not have a reading that can be paraphrased as there is an event in which spot didn't bark. It only has a reading that can be paraphrased as there is no event in which spot barks. Now, one way to appreciate this is that the unavailable reading is almost trivially true. It's made true by any event that happens not to be a barking by spot, for example, by the event of me giving this talk. Now, we see this in other examples. No dog barks, every dog barks, and so on. I won't go into the details except to point out that in all of these cases, the event quantifier always need to needs to take lowest scope with respect to the universal quantifier or the negative quantifier. Now, I want to introduce the standard, the traditional way of doing event semantics within the framework of compositional semantics and show that this does not predict the observed low scope of the event quantifier. And then introduce a fix that consists in introducing the event quantifier as low as possible within the entry of the verb. And as we will see, this will account for the, the low scope of the event quantifier and make uh, the facts we've just seen possible. As a side product, this will allow us to use either a syntactic or a semantic theory of quantification, which is, of course, the point that I'm arguing for, that you don't have to choose between these two. So first, let's look at the standard way that things are done. And here I want to, um, I want to use the Lambda calculator. For those of you who are familiar with the Lambda calculus, to illustrate my point, for the others, I want to simply say that one simple way of thinking about the way in which event semantics is traditionally implemented within Montague semantics is that verbs denote sets of events, or another way to think about it is verbs denote predicates which hold of events, which are true of events. For example, barking denotes a predicate which is true of an event if it is a barking event. Um, give or take the introduction of arguments. I'm simplifying a little bit here. Moreover, not only verbs, but also verb phrases and indeed entire sentences like spot barks are represented in the same fashion so that, for example, if barks is represented as the set of all barking events or in lambda notation, lambda e barking of e, then spot barks is represented after a few instances of beta reduction in exactly the same way namely as the set of all barking events whose agent is spot. I'm saying the same way because the point is that this, verb, uh, th is that this, this constituent here, which corresponds to spot barks, denotes a set of events just like barks denotes a set of events. Once we've done this, once we've computed the meaning of the sentence in a compositional fashion, we then need to turn this into a truth value in the way that this is done standardly is by an operation called existential closure whose role is to take a property of events and assert that there is an event of which this property holds. In this case, there is a barking event whose agent is spot. Now notice that this existential closure is a silent operator which is introduced at the very top of the sentence. And this is where I'll argue the problem lies. The problem with this is that it is not easily possible to think of the meaning of a verb phrase that contains a quantifier or of a sentence that contains a quantifier as a property of events, if indeed we want to represent 
meanings as sets of events or as properties of events. For example, if you have a sentence like no dog barks, then well, you have to ask you yourself, well, what could be the property that holds of an event such that we can say of this property intuitively, well, that's, the, that's what corresponds to the meaning of no dog barks. And we might say an event in which no dog barks, well, if we say this, and then we apply existential closure, then we essentially say, well, this sentence means there is an event in which no dog barks. But remember that this is not an attested reading of this sentence, because there is an event in which no dog barks is made true by the event in which I'm giving this talk. Since in this event, hopefully, no dog barks. So if we want to use this, uh, this way of doing things, and this is the standard way of doing things, we need to move the quantifier out of the way using an operation along the lines of quantifier raising, and this is exactly what is done here. So the meaning of no dog barks is not at first given in an assignment independent way, rather it is given as something which depends on a choice of dog and which then is modeled given this choice of dog as a property that holds of an event if that dog um, barks in this event. This is then closed off by saying that there is an event in which the choice of dog in question barks and then finally the quantifier is, in, is introduced in order to say that there is no dog such that the choice of that dog is such that there is a barking event <coughs> in which this dog barks. What you've done here is a syntactic approach to quantifiers. Now suppose that for whatever reason you don't believe in syntactic approaches to quantifiers. Suppose you want to use a semantic approach. Well then you're going to have a problem because there is no intuitive way in which we can think of the meaning of no dog barks in these terms. So what I'll argue is that the way in which we usually think of meanings within compositional event semantics, namely thinking of meanings as sets of events, is too simple. It's misguided. It forces choices upon us that we don't need to be exposed to. <coughs> and instead I want to argue that since the event quantifier is always introduced at the lowest possible level, that it makes no sense to wait until the entire sentence has been processed and then introduce it, but rather we should think of the verb itself as a place where the event quantifier is introduced. It will turn out that this also allows us to deal with coordination and with negation in whichever way we choose. So basically the, the crux of this talk is once we enrich the meanings of verbs, by putting the event quantifier into the verb, we have more room, we have less constraints, we are less constrained in the way that our theory, namely event semantics, um, interacts with other theories of coordination, negation, and quantification. Let me pause and ask how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Okay. So for the purpose of this talk, I won't go into many, too many of these details. I will show you a few derivations in this case, I will talk about how to give a meaning to the verb phrase kiss every girl. What I want to point out is that there is no need to think of this meaning as something that depends on a variable assignment. We can instead think of it as something completely independent, as something that stands by itself, as something fully compositional, if you will. The basic idea is this. Let's think of kiss as a property, not of events, but of sets of events. And instead of thinking of kiss as a property that holds of any event if it is a kissing event, we're going to think of kiss as a property that holds of any set of events if it contains a kissing event. The advantage of this is that we can use this same way of thinking about verbs also for verb phrases and for entire sentences. So that, for example, the verb phrase kiss every girl can be thought of as the set, or the property rather, the property that holds of any set of events if for every girl there is an event in that set in which that girl is kissed. So this additional room is crucial when it comes to modeling, for example, the meaning of negation and the meaning of coordination. So for the meaning of negation, for example, if you start with the, the view that a verb denotes a property of events, so I am now 
jumping ahead a little bit. Um, Uh, to section um, section six on page eight of the handout. So, if you think of well, to to harmonize with what the handout says, if uh, let's switch to a verb like bark. If you think of bark as a property of events, well, it's not clear what not bark should be. Like, should it be the property that holds of every event that is not a barking event? Well, if we do that, then we end up with a wrong meaning for sentences like spot didn't bark. We end up with saying this is true of any, just in case there is an event that is not a barking event by spot. Now suppose instead that bark is true of any set of events just in case in that set there is a barking event. Now on that view it is natural to think of not bark as being true of any set of events if in that set there is no barking event. And likewise, we can think of spot didn't bark as being true of any set of events that does not contain a barking event whose agent is spot. If we take this view, then <coughs> we can model the meaning of spot didn't bark by first computing this property and then saying that this property holds of the set of all events whatsoever. Because of, if the set of all events whatsoever is such that no event in it is an event in which spot barked, well then that means that spot didn't bark. So in this way we can make room in the denotation of verb phrases and of arbitrary constituents for negation, for quantification. And the last topic, namely coordination, can equally be given a treatment along the lines of predicate logic, the predicate logic view of conjunction, namely coordination amounts to intersection of sets. So take a sentence like John sang and danced. In a sentence like this, on the intersective theory of and, we want to place John in the intersection of the set of singers and the set of dancers. But now on the event semantic view, if we model sing as a set of all singing events and dance as a set of all dancing events, there is no way in which we can intersect these two sets and proceed because it might very well be that no singing event is also a dancing event. For example, if no singing event happened simultaneously with any dancing event, then certainly it can't be that there are any events that are both singing and dancing events. So we can't intersect the two sets. But now consider what happens if we represent sing as a property that holds of any set of events if it contains a singing event and dance similarly. Well, in that case, we can intersect these two properties, right? We can intersect these two sets of sets of events. And what we get is a property that holds of any set of events if it contains two things, a singing event and a dancing event. So here we see that modeling verbs and verb phrases as involving existential quantification over events allows us to give a natural meaning to and as involving intersection. Now this contrasts with the meaning of and that involves collective formation. I won't talk about this in great detail except to say that it has been previously claimed that if you use event semantics, then this favors the collective formation view over the intersective view of and. And what I'm showing here is that this is not so. So long as you're willing to consider verbs and verb phrases and sentences as denoting properties of sets of events rather than sets of events. So, in conclusion, what I've shown here is that event semantics does not commit you to choosing one theory over another. In the case of quantification, the two theories with respect to which I've asserted independence are a syntactic and a semantic representation of quantifiers. In the case of negation, these two theories are a view on which negation is represented as logical negation. And as for the other view, I haven't talked about it in detail, but it involves introducing special fusion events, which represent the sum of everything that goes on at a given time, kind of negative events, if you will. I've shown that it is not necessary to resort to fusions 
or indeed to any theory of negation other than the classical ones. It is still possible, although I haven't demonstrated this, to choose between these two theories, but it is not necessary. And in the case of coordination, the intersective view of coordination finds a natural implementation in event semantics, um, in the given framework of event semantics, and as for the other theory, the collective theory of coordination, it is still possible to implement it within event semantics. And it has been previously claimed that event semantics favors the collective formation view. Um, I've shown that that is not the case. So I want to end by pointing out that this is an active research program. Um, I've already mentioned at the outset of the talk uh, that there is a set of lecture notes um, that uh, it gives more information and far more details than I was able to present here about the various theories and their interactions. Um, there is also a paper currently under review um, which uh, is going to uh, give more information. Uh, all the links to the extent that they are not already here are at the end of the handout and I want to um, thank you again for inviting me to give this talk and I look forward to the questions along with Christina. Thank you. Thank you so much.